Blog Talk Radio. Wednesday, March 16th, 2011, our new showtime. Now, today's topic is quality assurance, forms and beyond, coaching to excellence. So, if you're listening live, I invite you to be part of the show and ask questions. And here's a few ways you can do it. Number one, you can email me at brian at benchmarkportal.com. Or for all of you at calltalk.tv, just chat with me in the center box there. If you're listening on the phone or close to one, you can also call in at 347-857-3117. But make sure to press the number one on your phone to let me know you have a question, and I'll do the best I can to get you in. Everyone who asks a question on today's show via email or phone will receive a free copy of Bruce's book, Benchmarking at its Best, and one person will be chosen at random to win an in-depth reality benchmark report valued at $1,500. I want to remind everyone that all of our shows are archived and available to listen to at calltalk.tv any time of the day. And now, I'd like to introduce the host of Call Talk, Bruce Belfiore. Thank you very much, Brian, and welcome back to Call Talk, everyone. Today we've brought back an expert on quality assurance, Lisa Corteau. Uh, She's joining us for Session 2 on quality assurance, and this one is going to focus on forms and beyond, coaching to excellence. Lisa Corteau is a graduate of St. Cloud State University in Minnesota, where she received a bachelor degree in both speech and mass communication. After several years of working as a news reporter in the media, Lisa began her career in the call center industry, where she's remained for over two decades. She has 15 years of experience implementing and managing call quality improvement initiatives, and most recently, Lisa has managed the call quality practices and training initiatives for over a dozen client marketing programs being serviced within a shared contact center at Carlson Marketing Worldwide. She was responsible for introducing and implementing a call quality evaluation program and onboarding new monitoring technology. She increased the productivity of the quality team by 45% and created an environment where the agents actually looked forward to and appreciated receiving performance feedback. She's been a featured speaker at quality monitoring software user conferences and has also been a presenter at the ICCM National Conference sharing successful practices for running call center initiative programs. Currently, she's collaborating with Dane Peterson, a senior consultant with Call Center Solutions and instructor instructor for the College of Call Center Excellence on a call quality monitoring program, Best Practices Workshop. Quite a mouthful there, Lisa. You've got a lot of uh, great things on your resume. It's my pleasure to welcome you back. Thank you. It certainly is a pleasure to be back and just continue our conversation about quality monitoring, obviously something I have a passion for. Yes, yes, uh, the, the, and a lot of great insights. Uh, we got very, very good reaction to the last time that you were on, so we're delighted to have you again. And, and one of the things, Lisa, that quality monitoring program discussions are, are usually centered on QA forms. In fact, I've seen that teaching the College of Call Center Excellence. Uh, oftentimes that's the, the first point of fixation and an important one. Uh, you know, how to set them up, identify items to put on the form, how many calls should be monitored. Uh, they are good topics, uh, generate a lot of valuable discussion, but there's another necessary component that's uh, needed to assure you're getting the greatest value from your QA program, which is the agent feedback and coaching. Could you talk to us uh, about that? Uh, absolutely. Uh, the feedback, and really more importantly, the coaching that happens in a call center is really what makes your quality program effective. You know, and the first step is understanding that feedback and coaching are actually two different activities. And you want to make sure that they're not happening in separate areas of your center, which I've seen happen. The quality team sits on one side and the coaches sit on the other side. Uh, if, uh, if you have a QA team or even if the supervisors are scoring calls and reviewing the calls with the agent, I mean, that's feedback. It's like taking a picture and talking about what happened at that point in time. 
coaching is much more involved as you're trying to teach someone a new skill or a new way to perform. You know, you're looking at trends and performance, you're creating action plans, and the coaching requires a strong working relationship with an agent in order for it to be effective. I mean, you can have a great strategy for your quality program, you know, as you mentioned, a fabulous form, you know, solid definitions, measures, trending data uh, for analysis, but the supervisor is really the one who's going to link all of that work to the agent through their coaching. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, uh, it, it brings to mind uh, one of those phrases from Vince Lombardi, which is coaching is really another word for teaching. And uh, I think a lot of people, when they're doing coaching, don't think of themselves as teachers, but that's what they're doing. And, of course, the best teachers really get you involved in what you're learning. It's not sort of a one-way street, is it? No, not not at all. Yeah. And, and uh, what would you suggest on that? I mean, coaching really is a skill. It needs to be learned, practiced, continually developed. Uh, we know that supervisors who are particularly those in a new role, they've recently been been uh, uh, promoted, don't necessarily bring that skill set with them. Uh, right. And coaching is one of those things that I think it doesn't matter whether you've been coaching for a long period of time or whether you're new to it, you can always benefit from getting additional training. Uh, and there are a, a, lots of places you can go. There's lots of methods for how to actually coach. But as you mentioned earlier, it is that two-way street. You don't want to tell somebody really what they're supposed to be doing. You want to get the involvement from the agent. They need to get have buy-in as to what you're talking about. They need to discover things for themselves. They need to make recommendations on what I think I can improve. And that's not always easy to do. And you have to make sure that you've got an idea as to how I want to structure this conversation so we can actually get to the point of making some improvements and the agent feels they've been involved, that their side of the story has been been heard and that it is a collaborative plan moving forward. Mm. Yeah, that's interesting about having their side of the story being heard. What what sorts of things do you think that agents usually want to communicate? Uh, Sometimes don't do it very elegantly and sometimes it's misunderstood by the supervisor but what are those things that agents are trying to communicate uh in in coaching sessions that that a good coach should be aware of well from my experience what i've seen is that agents really want to communicate that you know what i'm proud of what i do and i think i do a good job but what happens in a coaching session is you could listen to a phone call and they can say the agent might go well that was a really good call and the coach is going to say yeah but and the agent's not being heard. You know, they want to have a little bit of recognition, a little bit of acknowledgement of, yes, you are doing a really good job. And I think that's where some of the negativity can come around a coaching session. You know, uh, you don't want it to be just a coaching session, oh, I'm going to go, I'm going to sit with my coach, and they're going to tell me what I'm doing wrong. You know, they want to be able to say, hey, I think I do some good things, so let me talk about what I do well as well. And I don't think coaches always allow that time and that relationship building and that uh, sense of trust and that we can talk about this. And yes, you should pat yourself on the back. You're valuable. You do a great job for us. Mm-hmm. Right. Really, the, the the making sure that people feel like there's a sense of belonging and that this exercise is going to actually improve them as a professional is important. And, uh, you know, I was at uh, the ATA conference in Phoenix uh, the last couple of days and, and spoke on benchmarking there. Uh, There was another um, session that was given by a consultant named Sally Cordova from McKee Consulting, and she talked about something called mind darts. And and these are phrases that can have a negative effect on the listener. And uh, the way she put it, it it makes the listener wrong. (laughs) It's sort of a capital W-R-O-N-G. And and, uh, she was saying that, you know, we need to... In these things, use phrases that create a safe environment, sort of a, uh, an environment in which the agent is open to what we're actually saying. I think that's an excellent way to put it, mind darts. I like that. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, I, I was listening to another uh, session. I, I used to be a consultant with, with Bain & Company, and they had a, a webinar. And um, they've done research on change management. And one of the things that struck me in that with regard to what we're talking about today is that people who feel threatened don't hear what you're saying after they feel threatened. So given the fact that much of coaching has to do with nuances, right? In other words, you're trying to move somebody who's pretty good up to great 
uh, or, and, and you know, sort of the, the 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 average type of person or the average type of uh, call to becoming a great call. Uh, one of the things we have to realize is that really all nuance is lost where the person feels attacked. So the effectiveness of the coaching is stopped dead right there. And so we have to somehow be able to get across all these, you know, constructive criticisms, if I can call them that, but all of the points that need to be made, while at the same time making sure we create the, um, uh, the atmosphere in which they'll actually be heard and then accepted by the, uh, the agent. And uh, you, go any ahead. thoughts or tips on that? Well, I was, I was just going to say it brings to mind what you've always said. You know, supervisors are really agent advocates. And agents have to feel that, yes, when I'm talking to my coach, my coach is someone who's going to look out for me and is going to help take care of me and also help then improve me as well. So I think that's just um, one of the critical steps that, that is kind of missed sometimes when coaching sessions occur. And I think the reason behind it is a lot of times supervisors struggle to find the time to coach, you know, and they don't take as much time to prepare because they really need to prepare for the session. You know, hopefully look at what previous coaching objectives were. And they shouldn't feel they need to coach on something new or different every week. Sometimes it's a matter of recognizing the achievements that have already um, been accomplished by the agent. And, you know, and letting them carry that pride through and maybe going through a week of going, wow, I had a really good session this week. You know, don't feel like you're constantly having to, you know, tell the agent every week you've done something wrong or you need to improve on something. Mm-hmm. You know, it could be more of the positive sense of, gee, here's some opportunities that, you know, you might find something of value in this and leave it on their plate to discover and determine what is it that I want to try to achieve next rather than it always coming from the coach. Mm-hmm. And that way, too, you're not sort of brushing aside the fact that improvement is necessary. You're just making the improvement a uh, a next step in your development instead of a, a black smirch on your character today. You know, that's the, right. the whole thing. How do we do that? That's that's really the the key. And Brian, I think you have a question from a listener. I, I sure do. And actually, this comes from one of our uh, folks on Call Talk. And I want to remind everyone: if you're on Call Talk, you could just chat uh, some of your questions right there, or if you're one of our live listeners on the phone. I know we have a couple from Florida and uh, Canada, so uh, just hit the number one on your uh, keypad there, and I can uh, listen in and uh, get that question in to, uh, to Lisa or Bruce. But uh, right now, this one comes from Jasmine, and uh, the question is, is there a particular method of coaching that you would think is most beneficial in a call center environment? Hmm. What do you think, Lisa? Well, I would hesitate to say there's really a best method. Uh, I think there's a couple of things you need to take under consideration when you're trying to pull together what kind of a, of a, a coaching method you want to use, uh, per se. One of the things that I see lacking in some centers is that beyond how do you actually sit down and coach someone, because there's a lot of different, you know, types of training methods and and books you can get on how to actually sit down and coach someone, you also need to think about what's your coaching process. Uh, And what I mean by that is are you consistently in your center using the same kind of process? Do you have, you know, a coaching session is scheduled for 15 minutes every week, and during that session, you know, you're going to make sure that you have documented what the next steps are. You know, you have a follow-up action plan. It's something that's delivered and done consistently. Because if you don't have that and coaching just happens randomly, you're going to lose a lot of credibility in your coaching program. So you need to make sure that is set up. Don't leave it up to each individual coach to decide, oh, this is the process I'm going to use and this is the paperwork I'm going to use. You want to make sure you've got that consistent process for actually coaching. Uh, What this also allows then is it allows managers to create a metric they can look at it and say, okay, we want to make sure we get so many coaching sessions done in a week, a month. They have a way to measure that if everybody's working off that same process. It also allows managers then to see and observe how are my coaches doing because your manager is going to be coaching you on how well you're coaching your agents. And by having all that consistency in the format and the process, they can see you know, which coaches are doing really well and which ones might need a little bit more assistance. Mm. Yeah, there's a kind of a domino effect with regard to management's uh, sort of approach to coaching. So as you say, 
the agents are coached by the supervisors, the supervisors are coached by the managers, and if everybody has the same kind of approach, which is that I want to make you as successful as possible so that I'm as successful as possible, then uh, I think that helps out a lot. And by having the consistency that you're talking about, I think you convey the fact that this is an important activity. (laughs) It's not just something that gets uh, stuffed in when you can do it. Uh, Although I'm sure there's managers on the phone right now saying they don't understand the kind of pressure we're under when those calls start coming in. We do, uh, and we know that it's not easy. But still, if you can work it into your your schedule and get your workforce management uh, to under to understand that this is an important function needs to be properly scheduled but also needs to be done i think that's uh, that's really key it uh, it is tough to be done but the more consistency you have the more it's set up more things that are taken care of for you that's the less that you have to think about now bruce i don't know if you have any experience with this but for me any coaching process i mean it's pretty manual there really isn't any technology that I'm aware of that that really can automate a coaching process for you because you have to collect a number of stats. It's it's, it's all relationship um, and and not so much that can be done by any sort of technology. So it is time-consuming, which is why it's so critical to make sure your process, you've got a solid process, you've got solid forms, you know, everyone has got a coaching method they're using. Um, You can, you know, it's designed so you can get help from your from your manager, um, you know, they may recommend training classes then to actually improve your coaching method. Um, I know from, for Jasmine's sake, we didn't quite answer her question on what's the best method, but uh, I think you need to look at the overall structure and make sure that's set up, and then you'll get some assistance with the coaching methods that are out there. Mm-hmm. Well, one thing that I would add, though, with regard to uh, you know the papers you bring into the session and the technology side of it, is that if you do have technology that allows you a really good agent uh, scorecard, uh, dashboard, whatever word you want to use for that, uh, and it's done uh, pretty automatically, then that can be a big help. I've been in centers where, A, uh, it might not be done at all, and people basically just listen to calls, score them, and talk about them. Others where there are metrics available on the uh, agent, so going beyond the individual call that is listened to, they also know what your average uh, handle time is and uh, other statistics, particularly on the sales side that may have to do with your sales, et cetera, upsale, all that kind of stuff. Um, But you have to go to five different reports to pull all that together before you go into the coaching session. And then there are those uh, people in Nirvana where it's all brought together in mm-hmm. one agent, uh, you know, report, and you're able to rip that off the machine and, uh, you know, bring it into the coaching session. And you have that along with, uh, if you're really lucky, the customer satisfaction feedback for that customer as well. And so you've got, on the one hand, the quality metrics, uh, the ones that have been scored by the customers in terms of customer satisfaction, the ones that have been scored, uh, you know, by a monitor in terms of of that, and also those that are more cost-related, like uh, average handle time, et cetera. Uh, When you have that, you've got a pretty rich uh, group of, or uh, you know, uh, group of statistics and metrics to to, to really coach from. And, uh, if you know, that is something that does put you at a distinct advantage as a coach, as long as you then also bring the right attitude Uh, and the right words to the coaching session. And if you don't have that, if you're not as fortunate to have scorecards and all this data for you, you have to make sure that you understand how long is it going to take you to actually collect that data and prepare. Um, I'd be curious if we ask people, um, you know, in your center, how long does it actually take you to coach an agent? If you include the preparation time, the actual coaching time, and then any kind of documentation or follow-up that you need to do in addition to that. Do you know what that length of time is? Because that's the length of time that you need to make sure that you can schedule into your week. Um, if you don't mind, I'd like to talk a little bit about, you know, the pressures that people are under and, you know, everyone's saying, you know, there isn't time to get all this coaching done and how can we get around that? Oh, please um, do. Yeah, I know that's on uh, everybody's mind. Uh, one of the things, I, I, I shouldn't say one of the things, I think the primary issue can be time management. You know, time is not adaptable, but people are. 
if you just think you're going to find time in your week to coach or prepare for coaching, it's, it's not going to happen because, as you said, there's a lot of demand. There's a lot of other things that happen. But if you just can really get a handle on some time management techniques, it's something that's really going to help you out. I'm going to uh, share a little bit of a personal story here. Uh, this was a, a few years ago. <clears throat> Excuse me. My husband had asked me to do something for him. And I said, sure, sure, I'll get that done for you. Well, a couple days later, he asked me, did you get that done? And I said, oh, no, I've been so busy, and I rattled up all these things I had to do. And he just looked at me, and he went, well, Lisa, he said, it's not that you didn't have time to do it. You just didn't make the time to do it. <laughs> well, needless to say, at the time, it didn't go over very well with me. And, you know, I just went back at him saying, i got all these things going on you don't understand. And after a couple of days, I thought about it, and I was like, you know, he was right. I chose to do other things in place of doing the one thing that he asked me to do. And I wasn't honest with myself about it. You know, I should have just told him, you know what, I don't want to do it. Or I should have told him, gee, I'll do it, but I've got all these other things I want to do first. And then maybe he would have done it himself or found another way to get done what it was. So it's really a matter of just managing yourself and understanding what your habits are. Um, uh, one of the things that I think is, is planning is a habit. You know, you need to know how long does it take me to coach, and that needs to be scheduled in on my calendar, and that's the time that I need to dedicate it. It's not going to work all the time. There's going to be other things that creep in, but you have to schedule the time, and you have to make sure you dedicate yourself to that time. You know, you can procrastinate. Everybody does it. You just have to recognize when you're doing it. Mm. You know, uh, interruptions are a part of everybody's job, but there's interruptions you can control. I mean, how many people let email control them rather than controlling your email? You don't have to look at every email that comes in as soon as it comes in. Set some time aside and say, okay, you know, I'm going to look at all my emails in an hour, which some people might go, oh, I can't do that. But if it's really that critical, somebody will come and find you rather than send something through an email. You know, so it's really a matter of just getting into a planning mode, setting some goals, scheduling some time, and then just recognizing when you've got those bad skills where you're procrastinating or you're choosing not to do it because you want to do something else instead. Or maybe your coaching program isn't organized enough for you to even look and say, I need this much time, and this is what I can get done in that amount of time as well. Well, you know, I, I was just thinking how many times my wife has said to me the same thing your husband has said to you. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, you know, uh, well, yeah. uh, you know, the other thing about figuring out how much time it takes to do the coaching is that you might actually be able to, and if I can just stick this in, you might actually be able to uh, convince your senior management that you need uh, additional technology. For instance, the things that we were talking about, those uh, wonderful uh, dashboards, et cetera, what if – for example, that was able to bring down the uh, amount of time that you needed to prepare for this and made you more effective to the extent that you could actually justify, at least in part, the additional technology that was required. You know, these are things to think about, I think. So. Yes, and as long as you know what it takes to coach and how long it takes to coach, that's your building block. Right, right. Okay, Brian, I think you've got another uh, question here. I do, you guys, and this uh, this one's very appropriate. It comes in uh, under time management as well, but uh, kind of a different approach to it. This one is from Robert and uh, asking, how long should you allow for agent performance to improve after a coaching session? Ah, I think that's a very good question from Robert. Um, it's really going to depend on what it is that you're trying to change. I mean, some new skills and behaviors can be mastered rather quickly. Others are going to take a little bit longer. Uh, and uh, one of the things that you you need to be aware of is uh, is it actually takes, and I'm not a scientist here, but it actually takes a, a change in the brain for a behavior to change. Um, what happens is essentially we rely on what are called ingrained behavior behavior patterns, and repeating a specific behavior pattern over and over stimulates these brain cells and eventually they'll grow extensions and they'll connect with each other. And so with enough repetition, you know, these behave, new behaviors become ingrained patterns. You know, there, I'm sure we've all coached people on someone who says um too often in a call or some other uh, grammatical annoyance. And it's simple enough to have them put, the agent put a Post-it note on their computer, 
you know, as a reminder not to do this. You know, that's a, rather simple and something that is going to feel really awkward at first, but the more often that they realize, oh, I shouldn't be saying that, the more comfortable it becomes, and that's something that's pretty simple to see when that progress is made. If you're trying to coach on something that's a little bit more difficult, like maybe you want the agent to sound more sincere or it's an aspect of vocal quality, you have to make sure the agent has the opportunity to actually practice the skills, the new skills that you're trying uh, for them to achieve. Um, and you don't want to go too quickly. You want to give them time to not only say, oh, wow, it looks like you have achieved the goal here, Give them a couple of weeks to make sure that it stays so they don't relapse into those bad habits because that can happen as well. So the answer for Robert is really it kind of depends on what the behavior is. I just caution you, don't jump too soon. Make sure that they're very comfortable and it becomes that new habit for them. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, the, the toughest thing to do is to change, but uh, we're in uh, a world that requires it. And uh, there's another good quote I saw at the uh, conference, which was, if the rate of external change is faster than the rate of internal change, you're in trouble. Uh-huh. And, uh, that goes for companies. It also goes for individuals. Yes. So, uh, and in many of our call centers, too, they, people have to keep up on uh, a lot of uh, technical information as well as improve the quality of their calls. So, yeah, no, good point. Um, let's see. Do we have another uh, question here, Brian? Yeah, we do. I know we're getting close to our half-hour mark, but uh, this one came in from Rhonda asking, uh, besides training classes, speaking of change, what else can I do to improve my coaching skills? I can share something really quick here. One of the best things I ever saw happen was a manager invited me to one of her supervisor meetings, and she allowed 15 minutes at the end of every supervisor meeting she had And she asked one of the coaches to come with an example of coaching they had done that was successful or an example of where they got stuck. And I did not realize there were some fabulous coaches on her team. I had no idea. And they would bring this, the one that I listened to, uh, this coach brought this example, uh, and she was talking about how, you know, she was trying to get across a certain point to this agent, and he just wasn't getting it. So she had him listen to this call and said, what did you think? And he was like, oh, the agent said it was fine. They listened to it again, and she goes, how do you think the customer felt? And got the same response. Well, you know, I think the customer thought it was fine. You know, And then she asked another question. What do you think would improve this for the customer? What do you think would have made that better for the customer? And the agent thought about it for a while. They listened to the call again, and the agent actually came up with recommendations on what they could do to make that experience better. you know. And it was just a fabulous example for the rest of the coaches on not only how to coach, but how to coach a particular situation when you wanted the agent to be more involved as well. So I don't know what you call that. I call it like a coaching calibration session. But I think learning from the peers around you, you sometimes don't realize the talent you have uh, on the teams that you work with until you actually have a chance to share practices with each other. Yeah, I think the, those are the folks who are the best sources of the, you know, the ahas, the real uh, pearls that we can uh, take from uh, their experience and, and incorporate into our own. And uh, also b- because they'll tell oftentimes about the technique in the context of a specific situation. And then when we actually come up against a similar situation, there's something that goes off in the, 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 the mind that will sort of, gear us toward that answer and uh, therefore sort of enrich the the, uh, toolbox that we have uh, to bring to what we do. Yes. Yeah, Yeah, I think that's really good. And um, is there one sort of aha moment that you've had in the last year or so, Lisa, that you think uh, you'd like to share with us that really made a difference in the life of some agent or in the life of a call center? I I think my biggest ahas always came from the agents where I would encourage them to go beyond their comfort zone. Uh, it, it, and, again, it, it's not always what I think. It's more or less of what the agent is thinking. Sometimes you're just amazed, you know, when you encourage someone to say, you know what, why don't you try this? 
and they'll go out and they'll try it, and it will end up in some place you never thought it would. That went beyond your, you know, what you expected. So, as a coach, I would say, don't always think that you're going to have the answer for it, or that you're going to be the one to say this is how you have to do it, and this is what it's going to look like when you get done. Because what it looks like when you get done might be totally different than what you were expecting. Mm-hmm. Are there any situations where you just have to say you did a really lousy job? <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> And one one of the best phrases I ever learned. It was this is one of the first phrases I ever learned when I became a supervisor was being comfortable in saying, "This is not acceptable, mm-hmm. and will not be tolerated." I mean, there are times when you have to just get to that point to make the agent sit up, take notice, and go, "Whoa, I do need to make a change here." So knowing when to say that, having the courage to say that is also important. Absolutely, no, great, great points. Very good. Okay, well, I think we've reached the end of our uh, our half hour here, so I'd like to bring things over to Brian uh, to close things off. And uh, thank you very much, Lisa, for being with us. Uh, a pleasure as always, and uh, thanks to everyone for listening. All right. <clears throat> thank you, Bruce and Lisa. Thanks again for joining us for uh, Session 2. And uh, I want to thank all of our listeners out there, whether on the phone or uh, through Call Talk. And it's time to give away our free in-depth reality check to one of those listeners who asked a question today. And the winner is Jasmine. That's a $1,500 value. So make sure that you email me, Jasmine, at brian at benchmarkportal.com so that I can get it to you. And, uh, of course, I want to thank everyone, either whether you're listening live or not, maybe one of our archive shows at this point, and uh, that our next show coming up is April 13th, when we'll talk about IVRs, call flows and designs, with industry expert Jay Minucci from Service Agility. Don't forget to sign up for a free Reality Check Benchmark Report and see how your center compares to others in the industry. And, of course, our in-depth Reality Check Benchmark takes a much deeper dive into call center metrics and is free today, again, for Jasmine. From all of us here at Benchmark Portal, keep those headsets steady and your fingers ready. This is Brian Carrington signing out. Have a great day.